I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. I'm starting to think that the experiment in finding artists on Facebook is kind of working out the way I wanted it to. So I've always wondered this. Now, have you ever seen a skyline and you, it, like, let's say the moon is just gigantic. It looks like it's only a mile away or something like that. Just big and orange. Well, that happened the other day. I saw it and I took out my phone and I was like, oh, I want to take a picture of that. And this is what I always experience. It was just a tiny dot. I mean, I looked again. Moon was huge. Took a photo. Tiny orange dot. So I posted on Instagram asking, why is this? So I said, I don't feel like looking it up, but if someone knows why, please tell me. Why is it when the moon is hanging low in the sky and looks so big that it's only about a mile away, you take a picture of it and it just shows up as a tiny dot? And now, after meeting Melanie, she was able to help me out with this. She responded by telling me, it's because your phone camera is a wide angle. It would look more similar to what you see in real life if it was more of a telephoto lens. There's some physics involved, but this is the basic gist. That's why I shoot landscapes with telephoto lenses and get made fun of. Now see, that's exactly what I wanted to know. And now I know a photographer, and she was able to tell me that. This week I get to meet another person who reached out to me and she was, right from the start, a very enthusiastic and energetic woman. All I knew about her was that she's a horticulturist, which... I believe, is somebody that does landscaping? I'm pretty sure I'm right. Again, I didn't look that up. But from talking with her, that's what I got from it. The best part was, she reached out to me on her birthday. So I was actually talking to her while she was out enjoying the summer night with her family on her birthday. One of the things that she's really enthusiastic about is watercolor painting. So this week, I meet Robin Lee Kling. So what are you doing out at the Nitty Gritty? Getting my free uh, birthday burger and drink and That's right. <laughs> meeting up with a friend of ours and having and having dinner with my husband for a rare change. <laughs> I forgot it was your birthday. That's right. We talked about that over email. Well, happy birthday. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and you just got back from Summerfest. You said you, you and your son went out there. Yeah, we went uh, yesterday afternoon and evening, saw Oreo Speedwagon. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, it was awesome. Oh, they're still really good. The cool thing is I have a 12-year-old who likes classic rock okay. and 80s pop because my husband and I listen to it on the radio all the time. He plays the euphonium, or the baritone, and is, uh, is going into seventh grade. I used to live in Milwaukee. My cousin's husband works for Casio Music, and they uh -huh. supply all the instruments to the bands. So I used to get free Summerfest, you know, general admission Summerfest tickets. So I'd oh, cool. hang out at Summerfest like all day. And they had a good crowd, and it was great. <laughs> Are you from Milwaukee or, or Stoughton? I was born in Port Washington, just north of Milwaukee, and that's where my parents were raised. With my dad's job, we had, as my dad said, we did time in Northern Illinois, oh. in Freeport and Rockford area. But he got transferred to his home office in Madison when I was going on seven. So I pretty much grew up just three miles outside of Stoughton. Went to high school there. So I graduated from Stoughton High School. Was able to get a scholarship to UW Madison and commuted. We had neighbors that worked on campus. So the first two years I carpooled with them. And then when my sister was on campus, the two of us together splurged and got us a pass for a lot 60 and we drove to campus. What was your um, uh, scholarship for? Well, I was majoring in landscape architecture. So it was called the Vicki Lee Hirsch Memorial Scholarship. Oh. You had to have been a, a good student. And I, I was second in my class. So almost a straight A student. You had to have been born in Wisconsin, lived in Wisconsin, and going into a natural resources major. Really? Which mine was considered that. Yeah, it was, it, they had the right to really put stipulations on it. And it was through the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. So being the smallest college on campus, despite the oldest one, they had a lot more scholarship opportunities than people realized. My dad was an agronomist who did a lot of consulting with the professors on campus and staying in touch with the people who were, who were his professors. So actually one of his former professors was an assistant dean at the time. Mm -hmm. And my junior year of high school went in with my dad and sat down. I'm like, okay, I love science. I love art. How do I combine the two? And he suggested landscape architecture. 
my sophomore year, our professor, knowing that a lot of them didn't have an art background, so we did a lot of color theory, doing something that was monochromatic, things like that. Mm -hmm. But he had us work in watercolors. And it was the first time I found out that you could get watercolors in tubes, (laughs) that you could Uh control the thickness. And when I was telling my mom what I was going to need, she says, oh my gosh, I have, my mom also um, took art classes in high school and she was actually my first art teacher. She saw that I loved drawing when I was little. Yeah. was actually a rather good teacher. So kind of honed that and encouraged it. Like taught me how to do portraits and things like that. She goes, here, I've got this really nice set and it had a case and a place to mix your paints and it was metal and you know, things nowadays are made in plastic. And the paints were still good, so I just kind of built on that. We were kind of encouraged to sit outside, and we've got so many beautiful places on campus, especially that end of campus, Observatory Hill and over the lake. So I found I could take the paints with me. And (laughs) interesting enough, this was not one of my favorite professors, but I have to say he taught me some really good art techniques. Personality-wise, we just didn't jive. (laughs) But he was old. He was getting close to retirement, so he was one of those kind of grouchier ones. He did teach us a technique that no one else has ever taught me. You had to do very precise, almost engineering style drawings. I'm kind of a perfectionist. I like crisp lines. He taught us a technique before we doing a plan drawing and then do like scenes and views of what we would like our plan to look like. We were groomed so that we could present it in front of a city committee or a board to get a planning project approved. So we would take our projects and oh, I would use like a Engineering pencils, actually, where they have the very precise leads to so get the different thicknesses mm-hmm. and textures with it. We would photocopy that onto the thinnest, smoothest watercolor paper. So if you cut it to 8 by 10, 11 by 17, you could run it through a photocopy machine. Right. You could take a pencil drawing, get that nice, clean, crisp black line like India ink, but that wouldn't wash away in watercolor. I just, I, I really like that technique a lot. Mm-hmm. In another class, I had done a perspective drawing of my then boyfriend's parents' house. They had a new house that his mom was really proud of. And I like making gifts for people. I sat out front of their house and done a sketch, a perspective sketch for another class. And I'm like, hey, I'm going to take this one step further, photocopy it onto watercolor paper and give them the watercolor for Christmas. And did the same thing for my aunt's house, you know, to start out as a couple of gifts. Oh, and then I had a photography class, a black and white photography class on campus at the same time through the agriculture journalism department. I don't know if you're from the Madison area or no, Wolfgang Hoffman. I was born and raised in Madison. You were. Okay. Well, he was my photography professor. He did a lot of the photographs for publications for college of agriculture calendars in Wisconsin and had a really good eye and taught us being black and white, 35 millimeter. We, processed our own film, you know, developed it, printed it, showed us how to use the filters to print it. Mm-hmm. We were able to use the really excellent facilities they have in Vilas Hall. Okay. And he gave us our assignments well enough in advance that we could start working for a fi- on, tor- on our final portfolio ahead of time. So I would go in on Saturdays, work on my portfolio for the final project ahead of time. But he taught us to really look around, you know, look above you, look behind you. He had a lot of Minolta equipment, and he said, is that all possible? Borrow equipment from someone until you find out what you like. And my dad had a really good Minolta camera that he used for work and wasn't using at the time, so I got to use that camera. This professor was kind enough to let us, and trusted us enough to check out equipment from him Mm -hmm. that worked on our camera bodies. So I'd experiment with macro lenses, um, zoom lenses, uh, tripods, night photography, the whole shebang. I had always loved photography as well since I was a girl. And again, too, my mom started out giving me her old Kodak Instamatic camera. And she had enough sense about art to teach me, if you're taking something vast like a lake, you know, she says, oh, here, look at these beautiful orange lilies blooming. Get those in the foreground, and it's going to look a lot better having Mm -hmm. that in there with the falls. Did your mom have a background in art? Just in high school. It was kind of cool because it got me to living in the Milwaukee area, was living with my grandmother, and they had this incredible, huge cedar-lined attic. Going through things in the attic, found on the, the floor of the attic, nicely pressed and saved my mom's sketches and artwork from when she was in high school, which I thought was really darn cool that my grandma saved that. But outside of just high school, our mom just had like a natural talent and a really good eye. That and my, her father, my grandfather, so she's actually the person I'm named after. He is Robert. 
and thus I was named Robin after him. Uh-huh. He was a really talented ph- photographer too. His father, so my great grandfather, we have a, a, fa- a photograph of my grandfather is maybe a three or four year old. I think a three year old hanging onto his younger sister there in their long nightshirts. She's got a big bow in her hair and they're looking scared. And I remember saying to my mom, it's like, did great grandpa sneak up on them? And mom just starts laughing. She goes, no, you, you had to stand perfectly still. Yeah. They're looking scared because they're waiting for that explosion to go off. But it was such a good photograph that Kodak actually wanted to buy the rights for oh, really? it to use for advertising. But they told him he'd have to give up his rights, wouldn't be able to print it or use it. And it was his his children, his family. He wasn't about to give up the rights for that, which I thought was pretty darn cool. But I sh- I, annually, I go to a family reunion on that side of the family. And literally everyone, the first time I went, you, you didn't have smartphones or digital cameras yet. Right. I show up with my 35 millimeter on my neck and you know the relatives I hadn't met yet were like, oh yeah, she's related to us. Look at the camera on her neck. <laughs> you said you were putting together a portfolio in college. Was this portfolio to be used afterwards or was this just for your grade? I mean, what were you leading up to? That was just for my grade. Though what was kind of nice is he would take some of his favorite project assignments and to put them up in the bulletin board in the journalism building. I, I took the photography class for well, two reasons. One, I knew I would it would be something I would use as a landscape architect. I always took before and after photos so I could show my clients. I also kind of built up a photo album of you know, when they didn't know what a plant looked like, and I'm describing it. You know, oh, this <laughs> is what this will look like in this season and that season. Okay. When you see something beautiful, I just have this desire to capture it. I've often taken my photographs and turned them into watercolor paintings. Someday when I can afford to retire, <laughs> I'd like to take some of my favorite photographs and watercolor paint them. One time putting a show together for one of the Madison area hospitals, I had a big wall to fill. And at that time, not enough matted and framed watercolors oh. uh, or prints of my watercolors to fill it. And so I'm going through with my mom. I mean, I use her as a sounding board. And kind of my artistic advisor. She's also very creative when it comes to writing. And I feel part of the uniqueness of either a photograph or a painting is coming up with a a clever name for it, too. Oh, definitely. You know, rings a bell, has an alliteration, describes the feeling you want to portray or the feeling you have when you took it. So I usually bounce ideas off of her, too. Mm -hmm. She's extremely creative in that department as well. So I remember going through photographs, thinking what what I want to enlarge or do a painting of and thinking, I'm not going to end up trying to paint all this and work full time. And she's like, why don't you mat and frame and enlarge and sell some of the photographs? Yeah. As well as the watercolors. I'm like, yeah, that's a great idea. Mm-hmm. Master Blueprint or Master Graphics that's over on Park Street right. and Badger Road. I think it's still there. But they were one of the first places to have color photocopies. Really? Like $6 a piece at the time. Yeah. When that was I this? Of. Um, well, this would have been like late 80s. Okay. Okay. I was I was like, and, um, I, I can't imagine a time when there wasn't color printing. Yeah. I guess the <laughs> 80s. You're right. You know, because you could come there to run your blueprints and things like that. Yeah. You know, if it was something bigger than the equipment we had at school in our studio. And they also had a color copy machine. My mom came up with the idea. She goes, hey, you know, this place that this color photocopies. Why don't you, before you frame it and give it to them, make a color copy of it? Yeah. So I did that and started building a portfolio. And I have a brother five years younger than me. So sometimes picking up from school, I'd pop in, you know, pop in and say hi to them. And, you know, two different teachers are like, oh, our wives would really like to have painting of our house. Would you do one for us? Okay. And so I think there I, I charged 100 for each of them. But that kind of helped me start to build up my portfolio, going back and looking at those early watercolors, you can see a more hesitant. It's a little more translucent, the paint. Mm-hmm. As I got more confident in time, I was better at, you know, using a dryer brush, creating texture with leaves. I mean, I just, I love being able to build up. I have to say that professor I had in college, too, taught us how to make incredible clouds mm-hmm. uh, using, using really cheap toilet paper, you know, and a wash and oh, nice. blotting so, in your clothes. <laughs> so he literally said to use the, to use toilet paper. Yeah. I love that this is a real conversation we're having. <laughs> I mean, works well in an art sense. Yes. No. And I totally get what you to mean. I'm just saying it's funny that we're really debating toilet paper and paper towels and we're talking about art. I don't know. He convinced me that this is a good idea and it worked for me. So I've stuck with it. 
you had your uh, showing at the hospital and starting all this. Like, did you just show up at the hospital one day and said, all right, I'm going to hang up my artwork here? You know, I mean, how did that all get out? I figured, yeah, I was going to have to go back to that. It was a situation where my mother-in-law, the family I did, you know, one of my first house portraits of. Okay. She had been having terrible headaches. And after a lot of looking into it, found out that she had a brain aneurysm and oh, wow. was going to need surgery to save her life, literally, and which was a very scary thing. My schedule was a little more flexible being in the landscape field. I could somewhat schedule my days off a little bit ahead of time, unlike my husband's schedule. Yeah. So since he could not get the time off work, I said, I'll represent the two of us and be there when she's in surgery. And I, you know, at some point, I just can't sit anymore or read. You know, you're nervous and upset right. and worried about this person you care about. I mean, I have the most awesome mother-in-law in the world. I love her like a mom. She's so sweet. And I'm so grateful that <laughs> my husband's an interesting mix of his dad and his mom, but there's a lot of the sweetness <laughs> of his mom in him. Okay. I went down and kind of wandered around and saw they had this, you know, artwork for sale. Someone's business card was in the corner of their artwork, and it had a sign saying, if you are, are local artists and are interested in selling your work here, you know, come to this office. So I'm like, I'm going to ask, Yeah. you know, since I'm here. So got the business card, the person who was in charge of scheduling the artists. Meritor did it at that time at all their hospitals. I think they set it up near their gift shop so that if they saw something that really suited them, they could give it as a gift and, and as a way of kind of starting to, you know, help local artisans. I think it was the first time I did a show like that. Really? And, and you literally yeah, did walk up and say, I want to hang my stuff here. <laughs> I, I was yeah. actually right in my theory. <laughs> I mean, I just didn't come into the hospital and say, hey, I'm an artist. I want to. <laughs> right. You did I it in a more pleasant work way. Here. <laughs> well, well I, I thought, hey, someone else has artwork here and they have a sign saying we need artists. Yeah. Why the hell not ask? You right. know, there's nothing to lose. Most professors are teaching a subject they absolutely love. Mm -hmm. And if you want to know more about that subject and want to do well in that class, they are more than willing to find time outside their scheduled office hours to accommodate you and talk to you about it. Really? And, oh, I found that out. Yeah. I had an awesome meteorology professor who was an incredible photographer and did some of the coolest effects. I happened to run into him the sidewalk near uh, on University Avenue or Campus Drive or one of those by the, the Botany Gardens like a semester after I had him when I was doing a photography class. I'm like, hey, I'm doing a photography class right now. How did you get some of these neurological effects that you did? Yeah. Like he had lightning shots and sun exposure shots. And I said, do you have time sometime? He goes, I have time right now. Do you have time? I'm like, yeah, I do. So I followed him up to his office and he wrote all this on a piece of paper for me, how he, what apertures he used and what settings. and Really? Yeah. I mean, it was awesome. Huh. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't until I had a decent digital camera and... And I mean, I, I kind of did a minor storm chasing for a little bit in, in a safe way that I wasn't going to get struck by lightning, trying to get good lightning shots. Right. But it wasn't until a number of years ago, I was at a friend's house that had like a, a three exposure glassed in sunroom and could have the lights completely off in their condo and a storm was coming towards us mm -hmm. and got, you know, just had a perfect chance to get some really good lightning shots. But it literally, I mean, took probably like, 20, 25 years before I finally got lightning shots that I wanted to capture. You had mentioned in an email when your son was born, you had actually taken 12 years off and you were now looking into starting up again. And I can't say completely took off some artwork. I mean, I, I've kept up with the photography because that's quick and easy to take with you and do. Yeah. I get there's part of me that's a little bit of a photojournalist that I kind of like to document and capture my life, my, my son's life, my niece's life. Mm -hmm. They're important to me. And my, and my mom kind of did that with us as kids too. And it's nice looking back and getting those memories to click in when you see that photograph. Yeah. I ended up kind of teaching art for a while. Around being a nanny, I worked at a YMCA and I've taught preschool. Uh, I taught art classes for preschool all the way on up to high school. Hmm. My co-teacher wasn't really much into art herself. And so I loved being told to be in charge of it. I was working at Metcalf's grocery store on the west side and reading the paper, the state journal. There was a group of local artists that were having a show in a barn off of Fitch Hatchery Road, kind of between Fitchburg and Oregon. I was going to have that time off. I'm like, I'm going to go check this out. I ended up finding a group of artists all situated together that were kind of called Southwest 
Dane or something like that, the group, a lot of them were from Stoughton. Okay. Found people I knew. You know, one of the guys was the brother of someone I worked at at Leeds Nursery in Sussex. When did and, this happen, the showing that you're talking uh, about at the barn? Oh, that would have been, oh, maybe like about three or four years ago. Okay. And so I started getting that itch again. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, one yeah. of these artists at this at this barn show asked me, they're trying to give high school students the tools to know how to sell their artwork and run a business. And oh. I'm like, oh, how? what would you have done if you had access to that? And I'm like, right. yeah, I said, I didn't have access to any. I just sort of fell into it. It just happened to be people I met and ran into, like told me about the Madison Art Guild, and that gave me opportunities to show my artwork. It was cool. It was the first time I had been juried into a group, so mm-hmm. to get picked as well in this group was awesome. And it did both my Ukrainian eggs and the watercolor paintings. But within that group, there's a group of photographers, so I also participated with them. And my aunt had hired me to do a painting of her friend's lake cottage, which <laughs> her friend friend was married. Her best friend from high school was married to the owner of George Webb Hamburgers in Milwaukee. So needs to say his lake cottage, cottage would actually be a really nice house to live in. Uh-huh. And my uncle was a, is a pretty good photographer, got the photograph on the water. And the first time I ever painted water and the splashing waves coming up on the rocky shoreline, this house had a lot of glass. And I was able to do the reflection of the American flag that was flying outside. You know, I like challenges like that. You know, painting water was kind of a fun one. Yeah. And the, one of the Alan Centennial Garden scenes, I have a photograph of the font, one of the fountains in there and work that into it. And again, you have that beautiful, what was the Dean's residence. They stripped down the old paint colors and repainted it to what it was 75, 100 years ago. So I had that in the background, that really cool building. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing that's kind of nice with uh, digital photography. It's much easier to, I've often taken photographs of my work and just to give people an idea of what it looks like. It's so much easier to do that now than it used to be. And actually, I've, I've made friends with someone that moved into Verona a year ago, found out she's an artist too, and she does matting and framing. She's like, if you teach me how to watercolor paint, I'll mat and frame for you for free. I'm like, it's a deal. Uh-huh. Nice. <laughs> it's like, I'll do that. <laughs> I, I guess the reason I really like house painting because it's not just a house, it's someone's home, there are memories there. And a lot of people put a lot of time and effort and spend so much you celebrate so much there. So to have an artistic image, a hand done image of something that is important to you and your family. I did one for my parents for their 25th anniversary and knew that I think their house looks the coolest when the crab apple trees are in bloom and purposely did it then. You know, my parents are at the age where they don't want stuff. <laughs> they right. don't want to accumulate a lot of things, but they've always, when it's hard to find an idea for my dad for a gift. Over the years, my mom has hired me to do paintings of places they've gone on, you know, special vacations. Oh, well, that's cool. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool to see my artwork, at, you know, adorning their walls, and she kind of rotates it. And like I said, she's been, she was my first art teacher and my biggest fan all the way through. One interesting thing I'd like to say about this conversation is when I've spoke with people in the past, I asked them to send me some examples of their work so I can put it on the site when the show is posted. Now Robin, after talking with her and asking her about her portfolio, I asked her to send me something and she said she'd get some pictures to me soon. Now a couple of weeks went by and I still hadn't gotten anything from her and I was starting to wonder if she had forgotten or I didn't, I didn't know what was going on. Then after a few weeks, Robin said she had something for me and she sent me a bunch of photos of the work that she did, of the watercolors, of the landscapes, and the descriptions that she had talked about in the interview. And right after that, she created a Facebook page for them called Memories in Watercolor. And you know, I'd like to think that maybe having this conversation really inspired her to create this page and kind of promote her own work. Or she may have just done it on herself and I'm taking all the credit for it. But either way, I'm kind of happy that she was able to put that stuff out there and I'm glad that she did. So thank you, Robin, for talking with me. Visit the website at AmericanBandito.com or read my daily comic journal called Then This Happened on the website or on the Tapas webcomic app. The music for the show today was provided by Romcom. That's com with two M's at RomcomTheBand.com. Thank you all for listening and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. I'm going to meet another person next week, so so long. <laughs>